I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and we're going to spend the next 60 minutes walking through a six step strategy you can use to change hearts and minds for good. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we go on. Uh, but to introduce myself, I'm Doug Hadaway, the founder of Hadaway Communications. And we're lucky to have Evan Wolfson, the founder of Freedom to Marry and the architect of the strategy for the marriage equality campaign, which as many of you know, won an uphill battle against tremendous odds, uh, in part by achieving what social scientists call durable attitude change. That's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm also joined by Carrie Shum, who's my colleague here at Hadaway Communications. She was on the original team that brought us the Truth Campaign, which is one of the, the most studied and celebrated public health campaigns in our lifetimes. And they went up against the power of the tobacco industry and achieved durable attitude and behavior change around teen smoking. So I'm gonna start with a little background on what Carrie and I do in our approach to strategic communications and walk you through this six step framework, bringing Carrie and Evan in to, to talk about their experiences on those two uh, successful campaigns. Um, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A, uh, which you'll see at the bottom. A lot, you have a chat box and you have a Q&A box. I can see the Q&A box. So if you can put your questions there, we're gonna get to as many as we can uh, over the course of the hour. I'm gonna try to go through the material quickly and then turn to questions. And if some come up that are sort of easy to answer, we'll do that along the way. Um, I'm able to stay a little bit longer for folks um, who have a few minutes after the end time. Um, to tell you a bit more about uh, the work Carrie and I do, we are a strategic communications firm based in Washington, DC with clients around the world. And our mission is to use the power of strategy, science and storytelling to help visionary leaders and organizations achieve ambitious goals for people in the planet. That's our mission statement. And we work with foundations and nonprofits, government, business, anybody who shares our goals, our, our vision for uh, the people in the planet basically. And so we work in a lot of lots of different organizations, you know, but also organizations big and small um, all across the country and in different countries. And our approach is strategy, science and storytelling is sort of a systematic way that I think that helps you think about what do you need to do to change hearts and minds, to motivate and mobilize people for your causes. It starts with having strategic focus, a really sharp idea of your goal, the audiences, the people who need to take action to achieve that goal and what exactly it is they need to do. Then you need insight on that audience. You need to understand them. What are their motivations? How, how do they see things so that you can meet them halfway? And then we get into, if we are understanding our audience, how do we communicate with them? We start with what we call an aspirational narrative. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that in a minute a narrative to frame your cause in ways that people see their own aspirations and values reflected in what you are trying to achieve in the world. That's the beginning of motivating people to, to get involved. Then, of course, you need a great message with what we call winning words that people will retain and repeat to other people. Visual communication using inspiring images that support your messaging and your frame. Then what we call strategic storytelling, which we'll talk about later as well. And of course, meaningful engagement. How are you using the tools and the content and the activities and so forth at your disposal to engage people in meaningful ways and get them in involved in your cause beyond just kind of vanity metrics that are so often um, all you get from a lot of uh, communications campaigns. We're looking for meaningful engagement that achieves measurable impact. And for those of you looking for, I know we get lots of questions about how you measure impact in communications. Quick rule of thumb, communications can be held accountable to achieve three things, all of which are measurable. Raising awareness, changing attitudes, motivating action. There's a lot of ways you can use um, to measure those things. Um, those on the left are sort of what we do to help make all this happen through strategic communications. What we're gonna talk about today is the subject of this cover article in Stanford Social Innovation Review, which is one of the leading journals for social change. And with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, I was able to take some time out and 
look at the science of communication, and particularly aspirational communication, as well as what uh, I'd learned through the years working on different issues, and particularly the marriage equality movement. Um, so we're going to share that to you, and you can check out that article at ssir.org. So as we go through this six-step strategy, I'll pose questions to you, the audience, those of you who are listening, that you can, you know, prompt thinking on your part. And you can also pose questions, as I said, in the Q&A. That would be the best way to do the questions. So let's get into it. Here is Evan Wilson. I don't think you can see him on your screen because of the way we're presenting, but um, this is a quote, something he told me as I was working on this article. Merely having a majority is not enough. You need a solid majority. You need a majority that can't be eroded or peeled away. And he was talking about that in the context of what he was trying to achieve in the marriage equality movement. Um, Evan, you were obviously thinking big. Um, why is that? Why were you thinking big like this? Well, I think people should think big because what you really should be thinking about and starting with is what do you want? What, what is the vision you have for the world? What is the goal you're trying to achieve? And in our case, winning the freedom to marry, the campaign we designed to achieve that goal, that wasn't the whole goal of the entire LGBT movement. It wasn't the only thing I ever worked on in my life. It wasn't the only thing we thought was important, but it was a big and important goal that we saw as both a goal in and, in and of its own right, that is to say something that was important and worth attaining, but we also saw it as a goal that would in turn be strategy toward further advance. It would propel other advances on LGBT causes and making the country better. So it was finite, it was defined, it wasn't everything, but it was what we wanted. And I think you begin with clarity of goal and then shape a clear strategy and go down the rest of what I call the ladder of clarity, which you ran through very quickly at the beginning, Doug, in order to get to what you want. But start with what you want. How are you going to get to what you want? Thanks so much. I was informed that people could see us and not the screen. We were having some technical problems. Can people see the screen now? Can you put in a comment or a People are saying yes. Okay, thank you. So who, those who pointed it out, thank you very much. Um, you would think I would know how to use the screen presenting by now. Um, well, as Evan um, is talking about, they're, we're looking to achieve big change there. And we really had to, on the subject of same-sex uh, marriage, the way it, that's the way it was talked about. Evan can say more about why he doesn't use a modifier like that. Um, but when we first met in the mid, in the early 90s, it was a real uphill battle. Gallup first started polling on this issue in 1996, had 27% of Americans uh, supporting legal recognition of marriages between people of the same sex. And there was a relentless campaign against this, as many of you probably know. Um, ballot measures in 30 states that we lost, a uh, very well-funded campaign against uh, this kind of uh, equality. So there was a lot going against us. But fast, and I do remember at a time, um, at that time at a summit of, of activists working on, e on this issue, a, a pollster told me we'll never see marriage equality in our lifetimes. That was sort of how bleak it was at the time. Fast forward, Gallup's polling in 2018, we're at 67%. And what the uh, data is showing, we, we passed about 60% in 2015, as I recall, and it hasn't come down since. So we're maintaining this high level of, of attitude change. People aren't changing their minds back. And that's, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about durable attitude change, a shift in attitudes that persists over time and resist despite counterattack. That's what we're gonna talk about. How do you get to there? And in Building Evans Winning Majority, um, there was a number of ways that we went about it from identifying the audience to framing the message to telling stories to get there. This is going way beyond, as uh, Evan will talk about too, not, we're not just talking about message today. There's a lot to it. So switching gears to talk about the truth campaign, which Kerry worked on. In the early 2000s, one in four teenagers uh, reported smoking cigarettes. And the Truth Campaign led the way in cutting 
cigarette smoking to below 5% in 2019. And a 2005 study of that, of the target audience of that campaign showed that they also achieved durable attitude change. And they did that in the face of a lot of pressures, the same way the marriage equality was under a lot of pressure. They had really had their work cut out for them on the truth campaign with teens subject to peer pressure, uh, glorification of smoking and in the TV and movies. And of course, billions of dollars in advertising by the cigarette industry, by the tobacco industry. Now, I wanna pause on this for a second because this gets into one of the big ideas we're gonna talk about. Look at this ad. This is marketing cigarettes. But if you step back and see what's happening, it's really marketing an identity. It's, it's saying that this, it's a, creating an association between this brand of cigarette and this image of people who are cool. It's not that subtle. These are cigarettes for cool people. And that's what's going on in a lot of advertising. They're actually advertising an identity and kind of subtly connecting the product to it. Um, and that's one thing that the Truth Campaign did. They were up against that. How do you counter that kind of marketing? Um, and they did that by a campaign that sort of promoted an identity to counter that, the identity of like a cool non-smoker. Um, and that I think is an important aspect to think about um, for when you're looking to change attitudes on any issue. Um, think about the audience and what kind of people they wanna be and how you can help them get there. And we call that aspirational identity, or ideas and images of the kind of people we wanna be. And it's a really interesting way to think about what you offer to people as nonprofits and social movements, opportunities for us to be our best selves, to live up to our ideals. So understanding what that are, that is, and how to connect to it can be a really powerful idea. Um, Carrie, you were part of the original team that launched this um, and created the Truth Campaign. Tell us a little bit about how you went about that aspirational identity approach. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing in this, I mean, it's 20 plus years later, but nobody had branded a public health campaign like this before. And that was the whole idea before it. It was a brand for teens, by teens, um, and devoted to, again, it wasn't about being tobacco free. It was about being united. It, the, the tagline was a generation united against tobacco. So it was, there was a group of people, they all had a shared vision, and they had one goal. And so we did all, I mean, thank God, in some ways, the tobacco company had laid out the playbook for us and we just stole from it. So we had gear, we had a brand, we had cool events. Um, you know, we had lots of ways for the teens to be part of it and demonstrate that they, that they were part of a group. You know, that's what every teenager wants is, is to stand out and yet be part of a group of, of people who they um, believe to be cool and want to be part of. And we just did that with the campaign. That's gonna come up. We're gonna talk a lot about identity, aspirational identity as we move through this. Let me show you the, um, the framework. Six steps, we call it, change hearts, minds for good. Focus on people who are ambivalent, understand their anxieties, connect your cause to their authentic aspirations, frame it with winning words, share strategic stories, and help them think it through and be their best selves. We're gonna go through these one at a time and I'll bring in Evan and Carrie to reflect on those. And I'm gonna present a little bit of the science behind them. First, when you look at the middle ground of public opinion on contentious topics, lots of times you're gonna find people who are ambivalent. I think it's a little more of a, a nuanced way to look at people who might either say they're undecided, or in this case, we were, for the marriage movement, we were looking at people, many people had already said, I don't agree with that. And we were looking for people who we could shift from no to yes. But the big idea here is looking at people who have conflicting beliefs or feelings. They may have already said, no, I don't agree, but beneath the surface, they're kind of torn. And that's, that's one definition of ambivalence. And that's when you say you're of two minds or you feel torn over an issue. And here's what the science says, because when we feel that kind of inner conflict, it makes us feel uncomfortable. And we will want to do one of two things. We'll either avoid the issue, which is of course an easy thing to do, or we'll do what the psychologists say, we'll approach the issue and actually lean into it. That's your opportunity to really change somebody's mind in a really significant way. Um, 
And that one thing on the marriage issue is you couldn't get away from it, right? Ballot measures in 30 states, debates on politics all the time. It was very difficult for people to avoid the issue. That was one dynamic going on with that issue. And the way that um, Freedom to Marry uh, looked at targeting ambivalent people was talking to people said they favored civil union and opposing, but opposing marriage equality. Evan, could you tell us about these conflicted voters and your thinking there? Yeah, I think you, you painted a good picture. These were people who, uh, they were not the hardcore haters. They were not the ones who absolutely loathed gay people or, or were organized against gay people. And there are definitely organizations and even a, a set of the population that is like that. But we worked very hard not to push the people who weren't yet with us into the camp who, of those who were dead set upon us, uh, against us. We saw them as the reachable, but not yet reached. And the conflicts they had, you know, could stem from many things, you know, things they learned as kids, the, the way they thought the world just sort of was, expectations about roles and behavior, anxiety about their own marriages. Uh, and if you ask them questions like, you know, should gay people be treated fairly? Or is it, or even do you think gay people should have health coverage or, uh, be treated well with regard to immigration or whatever, more or less pe those people would tend to say yes. But what they couldn't do was connect it to why we should have the freedom to marry. For them, marriage was something different. It was something that gay people didn't apply to, and that didn't apply to us. And so the, the conflict we had to help them resolve was to get over those anxieties, some of that ignorance, some of that nervousness, um, but also that question of why do gay people need marriage? Why can't you just call it something else? Sure, you should have health benefits, but that's not a reason to get married, et cetera. Let's look at the truth campaign. The target were young people who had never smoked a cigarette but wouldn't rule that out. Um, Carrie, what did you find out about teens who were ambivalent about smoking? Well, the, the reality is it wasn't about smoking at all. It was about control. You know, that is the job of a teenager is to decide who they want to be and and what things they're going to decide to do, to do and be as part of that persona. And, you know, I'm not going to rule out smoking a cigarette because, again, there's cool people who do it. It might be interesting. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but I don't want to I don't want to close out any of my my avenues. Um, and tobacco use fits in there because literally every single authority figure in their life is telling them not to do it. So the message they were getting was don't do it, reinforced by teachers and parents and the school nurse and, and yet it seemed cool. And so what we did was, was, was put in a completely different set of messengers and they were never saying don't smoke. I mean, that's a really important thing about the truth campaign. There were kids who smoked who were part of the truth campaign they were also united against the tobacco companies. So the whole thing was putting kids in, in charge and saying, you can decide to do this, but we just think you should know that there's a whole industry devoted to doing nothing but convincing you that you're thinking for yourself. And when we did that, the kids said, well, that's actually not that cool. I'm not rebelling. I'm not making a decision. I am being marketed into it by a whole enormous industry. And knowing that, it's a lot easier to resist it. Interesting, because when you've got somebody who's of two minds here, it's a, it's more nuanced communication. And this was a very groundbreaking approach in public health. So for those of you listening, take a second, think about it. Think about your cause. And this is where empathy comes in, right? The ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, try to see things through their perspective, what might be tensions inner conflicts that people have around your issue. That's how you start thinking about this particular audience. And this isn't gonna be your only audience, but this is one you have a big opportunity with. Let's look at the next step, understanding their anxieties. Anxiety is defined as a feeling of dread over an anticipated threat. So there's a little nuance here. A fear response technically is when you're responding to a threat in your environment, it's a physiological response and you go into fight or flight or freeze mode. You've probably heard of that. Anxiety has the same effect on us, but it's our imagination. We're worried about something that might happen in the future. That doesn't mean it's not real or anything, but it's technically a different thing where we're imagining what might come at us. 
Um, and you see how this, like on the marriage issue, there was a lot of that, imagining things that might happen that weren't really a threat, an immediate threat to somebody. So we're in this that sort of uh, realm here. And the problem with that, um, and the reason you have to deal with it, if you're gonna change hearts and minds, is that this sort of anxiety shuts people down rather than opening them up. It makes it harder for people to process information um, and that sort of thing. So we have to get people through anxiety to get to persuasion. So it's really important. On the marriage issue, um, my team worked with uh, Dr. Mitzi DeSells and, other, and a team of psychologists from a group called APTER that specializes in emotional research. And we talked to people across the country about um, this issue and, and saw lots of anxieties and doubts. This anxiety about society descending into chaos, and this was just going to drive that faster. Uh, uh, relationships not seen as genuine, as Evan had mentioned. The institution of marriage being redefined or undermined in some way. And of course, uh, government forcing religious groups to perform same-sex weddings, just technically not true. But these were the sort of anxieties. Anything else, Evan, that you recall about anxiety or fear that people had around this? Um, the other, uh, sorry, I got bumped off for a little bit, but I'm back. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I would just mention is that as we gradually made progress and won more and more support, we, we essentially were taking the arguments of our opponents away from them. It used to be enough for them to go after gay. Just gay was bad enough. And you know, people had fears about gay people. Gay people were predatory. Gay people were dangerous. Gay people were ill. Gay people, were... and that used to work for them uh, through much of even my lifetime. But eventually, over time, we made progress, and the, and and increasingly, a majority came to not accept that kind of crude anti-gay. So then they sort of went from gay to marriage, and there was a whole set of uh, buttons they tried to push amongst people about. Gays are going to undermine marriage. They're going to take away marriage. Why should a small group be able to redefine, quote unquote, marriage for the rest of us? And so that whole wave of bills being labeled the Defense of Marriage Act, defending marriage, was, was that kind of anxiety stoking by the, by the opponents. And eventually, as we kept working and moving, we were able to get most people to reject those arguments, too. And obviously, there's always some people who stick with, and gay still work for some, marriage still work for some. But as we, over time, were able to continue our work and take those arguments away and win over people and assuage their anxieties, what the, what the opponents basically were left with, with was trying to flail around finding any anxiety they could tap. So they would touch, talk about things like, as you said, attacks on the religion. You know, gays were going to force churches to do this or that. Gays were going to use up the marriage licenses. Non-gay people wouldn't get married anymore because gay people would ruin the club. Um, or they would say, we're victims. You know, gays are, those mean gays, by their insistence on equal rights, are undermining our ability to have the kind of world we want. Uh, we, need, we need to protect ourselves against this kind of attack. So there was a, a shifting set of anxieties, but, but happily uh, decreasing in, a, in efficacy amongst more and more of the people as we continued our core engagement and also addressed some of those anxieties, but then pivoted back to the core effective change message and change work that we were doing that over time brought us success. You know, of course, stirring up fear and anxiety is not an original <laughs> tactic, right? That's, that's a big part of politics. A big part of thwarting um, progress on social justice is to stir up anxiety among people. So as we move forward, you're going to see how ideas you can use to help overcome that. Um, it's not going to be going away, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, let's look at um, the truth campaign and an insight here from public health, this is from John Hopkins. One consistent experience of adolescence is a constant feeling of being on stage and that everyone and everything is centered on their appearance and actions. It is like bringing me back to middle school. This is a constant, puts teens under a lot of uh, anxiety around peer pressure and so forth. Carrie, was this part of what you had to deal with? How did you sort of address anxieties among teenagers? 
Yeah, well, we, we have, yeah, absolutely. You know, any teenager is overwhelmed by the idea every day of, you know, do I fit in? And what we did was give them a place where everybody fit in. And like I said, we didn't exclude smokers from the truth campaign. Anyone who wanted to be part of it could be part of it. And the other thing was we didn't focus on individuals. We focused on systems. And so we gave them a system to be part of through truth events and um, ac actions. We had a lot of grassroots activism and actions that kids could be part of, as well as cool stuff. I mean, we had concerts. We had, you know, uh, just all kinds of local things that kids could do at their school or in the community. But then we showed them that like, there was this whole other system that, that they really didn't want to be part of. Um, and we showed like the, the really insidious way that the tobacco companies had woven their messages into everything, everything that was around them. And somebody put in the chat, you know, I forgot what tobacco ads look like. You <laughs> also forget, you know, any convenience store door in America, when you, the little sign that said push or enter also said Marlboro. <laughs> so, you know, there were things like that that we brought to life. And we, you know, for little kids, younger kids, we would do things like, you know, track all of the stuff going on and, you know, how many signs do you see in a given day? Um, and, and bringing that to life, you'll say, why, why does that sign say Marlboro? How come there's a vending machine? And there was a, a, a huge policy part of this as well, to ban vending machines, to ban tobacco signage within certain um, distance of schools and playgrounds, that kind of stuff. But that used to be everywhere in America. We got rid of that. We also made kids see it. And they thought, well, that isn't exactly the world I want to live in. Let's move on to ways you can get past anxiety. Whoops, sorry. The presenter mode is really messing me up here. I'm having trouble controlling the screen and looking at questions. Give me one second here to get out of this. Sorry, folks. I don't understand the vagaries of, uh, there we go. Um, so for, of course, turning it back to you listeners about your issues, what anxieties might people feel toward the change you aim to create? Um, Carrie, sounds like you can see the chat <laughs> yes. or any questions. Um, other, could you keep an eye out for any questions we could wrestle with quickly? Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions about sort of how did we get to the anxieties? What kind of research did did we do? You know, how did you figure out that you would hit that you understood the right anxieties? Yeah, I know for the research we did, um, looking at we did a research with people who knew um, lesbian and gay people and couples, um, and the psychologists used a number of exercises to get them talking in ways that then people aren't used to talking about that sort of thing. For example, they would have a, a list of cards with emotion words on them. Happy, sad, joyful, blah, blah, blah. It's amazing when you look at the language of emotion, dozens of words. And people, they said, okay, when you think about this issue, look at the word, and if it relates to how you feel, put it in one pile. If it doesn't, put it in another pile. Amazing how quickly people could go through that and then pick up the pile and start talking through the emotions. So it was a pretty, very simple technique, uh, but understanding a lot of people aren't well-versed at talking about emotions, particularly not about controversial issues or about members of their family. So it was a lot of work to get there. And we did find a lot, but then that's part of the, the process is you then explore messages and um, stories and things that help people change their minds. You find out what what creates those effects. And actually that's what we'll get to here because that's a good segue to a big idea. If you wanna get over anxiety and also really motivate people for your cause, connect it to their authentic aspirations. And I define those as ideas about the kind of person you truly wanna be, the life you wanna live and the world you wanna live in. And this is a big idea because our aspirations are a big part of our identity. We have aspirations about all different kinds of things, uh, the kind of work we wanna do, things we wanna learn, serving our community. There's all sorts of areas of our life where we have aspirations. And th these things add up as a really important part of our identity. 
and our, our authentic aspirations are the things that are really driving us. And when we get up out of bed every day, when we're really doing with our own time and talents what we want to do. So really understanding that is a powerful thing. So for the research that we did um, with uh, Mitzi after Mitzi DeSell and others, was to talk to people about their aspirations around marriage. So when it comes to marriage, what do you hope for? And for, with people representing all, you know, from all different backgrounds and experiences across the country, you heard similar themes. It's about love, it's about family, it's about a lifelong commitment. That was a big idea, something you stick with for life. Um, and think about that. Yeah, that's an aspiration, right? The data shows that about half of marriages don't last for life, but it's, what's, it's something people want. Um, so that's an important aspect of it. And that's different from what pu typical public opinion research would do is ask people which side they agree with in the debate. That's not what we were asking. We were starting there. Now we asked the same question of gay and lesbian couples who wanted to get married. And guess what? They had the same aspirations, love, family, commitment. So what we saw there was a shared aspiration a common way that people who were voting on the issue and people whose lives and relationships were being judged and voted on actually had the same idea. Um, Evan, what's your reflection on that, this idea of the, the shared aspiration? Well, I think the thing that is the most striking about that is that the problem was that the people we were trying to reach, the reachable but not yet reached, the conflicted middle, the quote unquote civil union people, but why do they need marriage people, that five to 15% of the population, they didn't know that we have these shared aspirations. So when you ask them, as we did in focus groups, as you know, uh, we, we would ask them things like, why did you get married? Why did you want to get married? And as you said, their number one answer was love, love and commitment commitment to the person I love. And then when we would ask them in the very same focus group, why, did, why do you think gay people want to get married? Their number one answer was, I don't know. And if we push them to come up with an answer, they might say, well, maybe for you know, health benefits or something. And so that was the light bulb moment. That was the realization that for that group of people, they just didn't, they didn't see those common aspirations. They didn't fully understand those aspirations. And of course, it's not just a matter of preaching at people. It's a matter, of, and I'm sure you're going to get to this, it's a matter of showing people. It's a matter of helping people see this, not just telling them it. So the, the rest of the work we did was now heavily focused on that 5 to 15% people that we still needed to get after having previously done effective work and effective messaging that had brought us from 27% to over 50%. But we needed to solidify that 50%. And for that, we needed to tailor the message and the understanding in, in, in an equally authentic way, but to the problem that we were trying to solve. The people, uh, the, the omission, the gap, the, the uncertainty, the lack of knowledge, the, the, the nervousness that the people we were trying to reach had not yet overcome. Let's look at uh, teens' aspirations. Um, looking at uh, data about teens and their aspirations, and I know all of us have been through this, and many of us have, have kids. This is very familiar stuff. To be independent from adults, express their individuality, take more control of their lives as emblem emblemized by getting the car keys. <laughs> I love that one. Um, these are the kind of aspirations that um, that are driving teenagers, and this is a different thing, right? These are, what Evan and I were talking about, we're specifically, okay, marriage, what's your aspiration? Here we're saying, okay, life stage, what are general aspirations that are occurring and how do we tap into those? Um, and Carrie, the truth team did some really groundbreaking work here at a time when what we would call participatory research was not a common thing, um, where you engage with the community, with the people whose lives are being debated, that sort of thing, getting them involved. How did you all go about engaging young people and figuring all this out? Yeah, we did a lot of it. And there's some questions about, you know, did you test ideas in focus groups? And, and the answer is, is no, but that didn't mean we didn't get feedback. So 
at the time, so True started in Florida. It was the state of Florida, the, the second or third state to settle with the attorneys general on the, the master agreement on tobacco control. And part of that agreement was we had to stand up a campaign in some, I don't remember exactly, but ridiculously short period of time. So we convened a, a summit of teenagers from throughout Florida. There were five or 600 of them within a couple of weeks after you know the authorization to go forward with the campaign. And the, the ad, it was, I was working for the communications agency. There was a, a big ad agency called Crispin Porter Bogusky. So we came into that summit with sample campaigns because we had to get stuff in the air immediately after that. Um, and the, the ad agency thought they had the campaign, but they had a couple options, but they knew deep in their soul that one campaign was the right campaign. Um, and they showed them to the kids and the kids said, in no uncertain terms, you people have no idea what we actually want. And that campaign is not good. Um, and we like this one. And so the, the campaign that the teens liked was truth. The campaign the ad agency thought was gonna work was called rage. And the teens said, we're not angry. I'm not fired up about this. I just want to know the truth so that I can decide for myself. Um, and had we not done that kind of, again, it was five or 600 kids who saw the sample advertising, we would have gone on air with something that may, might not have worked. Um, we also did have kids involved from, from day one. I mean, it's now, you know, it's second nature to have a teen advisory committee or a teen, you know, teen board members. We had a teen advisory committee that we worked with we helped plan all the grassroots events with them. Many of them were in the ads. And one of, one of my biggest realizations in the last year, for anyone who listened to the 1A or watches MSNBC and knows Joshua Johnson, he was a teenage kid in the Florida Truth Ads. Um, making prank phone calls to tobacco companies. So I'd like to think that maybe we led him on that path, but um, we had these really incredible teenagers who advised us all along the way. Yeah. And that was also a good segue to our next topic. For those listening, again, thinking about, okay, my issue, what are people's authentic aspirations when it comes to the issue I'm working on? Step four, frame it with winning words. And it was interesting what, um, Carrie, you were just talking about. The consultant said, call it rage. And the teen said, no, it's about truth. That is a really important reason to do that kind of engagement with the target audience, whether it's through formal sort of market research or even just trying it out with people in your circle, you know? Um, and I'm not surprised they said, let's go with rage, right? That is such a common thing in social change communications to trap tap into anger. And there's a lot of things to be angry about, no doubt about it, but there's a lot of other emotions. Um, and you really do need to step back. A lot of, I know having worked in politics for many years um, and working on the front lines of lots of controversial issues, a lot of people on the front lines kind of like that. They like the fight. A lot of people don't. And there's different angles and ways to think about, look through the emotional lens. Um, so getting to the language, frame it with winning words. I want to talk about the word frame because that's such a common term these days that you hear a lot. And it's out of cognitive psychology. It basically comes down to this. The first thing you say about a topic and the most frequent thing you say about it influences all the perceptions and judgments that follow. So how you start the conversation, the first thing you say the stuff you put on the website and the, you know, the stuff that people see first is really important real estate. And you want it to be winning words. This is a, um, shows some of the scientific insights we use in our work to craft messaging. If you want a word that really motivates and mobilizes people, they need to feel it, believe it, see it, and say it. Feel it means it creates an emotional response. What I was just saying about emotion isn't don't be emotional, it's be smart about the emotions around the issue. What the science says is that emotion works with cognition. It works with our brain, in our brain, to help us with attention and retention and motivation. So our communications need to create some kind of emotional response so people will notice them through the 400 other messages, literally, they get during the day and remember them and be moved by them. They need to believe it. Now that means Sure, it needs to be truthful, factual, that sort of thing. But a really interesting theory, an important one, is called fluency theory. It says that the more fluently you can process information, the easier it is for you to understand something, the more likely you are to trust what you're hearing. 
So for people to believe what they're hearing, it needs to be easy to understand, interestingly. There's other elements to that too, but that's really important. See it. We are more motivated to achieve goals that we can visualize, that we can picture in our mind's eye. That's why visual communication is so important and why you want to use words that are vivid. They create images in the mind, people, places, things, actions. Help them envision the future. And then say it. We want to take advantage of word of mouth communication, which is still the most powerful. The internet is essentially technology driven word of mouth communication. So we want language people will remember and repeat. So when it came to the marriage issue, we already talked about the big idea and the, the words were pretty simple, right? The aspiration became our message. It was framed in terms of love and commitment. This is not fancy. These are super simple, super meaningful words. Um, and they're familiar words. They're emotional words. People obviously understand them. They evoke images of people in relationship. This checks all those boxes we just talked about. And Evan, this was, you used a couple frames over the course of the campaign, and that's one of the good strategic insights. This was an important one to get to that 60 something percent, but tell us about the different frames you used. Yeah, one of the questions somebody asked in the Q&A is, are you trying to find aspirations that cut across everybody, or are you trying to figure out the aspirations of the target audience you're trying to reach? And uh, you're, you're the communications expert, Doug, but, but my answer to that would be, we were thinking about whom did we need to move. And so you, you might change your emphasis, you might shift messaging, and it's not only about messaging, it's also about the working, the organizing, the lobbying, the effective engagement, the mobilizing, the, the getting out the vote, et cetera. There are many, many tools in your toolkit, but speaking in the communications realm, it wasn't enough to have had success, as Doug said, on the different messages and different ways we had communicate what was at stake over the years, which had grown us from 27% to uh, a majority, 50, 51, 52, uh, 53% by 2010. We needed to solidify that majority. We needed to grow. And in order to make that happen, we needed, we needed to look at the people we hadn't yet reached. And those are the ones we've been talking about lately. For them, what they needed to hear was this real emphasis uh, on love and commitment, and not only the words, but stories and images and messengers who we who we conveyed those aspirations, those meanings. Other important and valid and effective messages or frames were uh, equality, dignity, freedom, inclusion, family, uh, the the meaning of the Constitution, uh, the law, human rights health coverage, benefits, rights and responsibilities, the, all of those elements were authentic and real and, and they worked with different people. And, and really the story of our success was that for the first several decades, it was a mix of messages and a mix of arguments and a mix of engagement because we were needing to, to pull together a mix of different audiences and different cohorts and different sets of the population. But once we had gotten to that majority and now wanted to solidify it, we really had to pay attention to what's with the people we haven't gotten yet. Not the ones we'll never get, but the ones that we could get but hadn't gotten yet. And so focusing on those people, it was the love and commitment, the personal, the story, uh, the, the common humanity frame, helping them to see those aspirations as being shared aspirations. That's what they needed to hear and talk about the law or justice or the constitution, even though real and, and important, talk about rights and benefits and health coverage, even though real and important, was kind of getting in the way of what those people, that sort of last target audience needed to hear. And so we worked very hard to revamp the case we were making in order that it be effective to the next group of people we needed to bring on. And that's always a, that's a really great question somebody was asking. Always target audience, who must take the action to achieve your goal, what moves them. Um, and Evan was speaking about getting that to that from 50 to 60 plus percent, that's what we're focused on here. <clears throat> so there's no silver bullets, particularly for movements that take a lot of time. You're gonna have 
a number of messages in your toolkit. I think this is one that is one of those has potential to be a very big sort of brand level idea that a lot of people can see themselves in. So it really depends on your issue and what stage you're in as to what that sort of mix of messages looks like, I think. Kerry talked about truth and how the, that word became so important. It was what was really the teenagers were after. Um, and it really helped set up a story about the teenagers as truth tellers. And we'll talk about that in a second. And another important thing about the words that the Truth Initiative use, uses now as well is this. This is one of their uh, one of their many cool branded sort of communications says, we are the generation that will end smoking. A linguist will tell you this is called identity framing. This is putting the words in terms of the kind of person I am, in this case, the kind of generation we are. And that is a very powerful technique for crafting messages that motivate people. There's a lot of studies around this. A very famous one is about voting. And in a controlled experiment, people were asked, will you vote on Tuesday? This was before a le uh, an election. And others were asked, will you be a voter? And the people were just simply prompted with a message and a question about being a voter, turned out to vote, actually did it in much higher numbers, statistically significant um, responses than people who didn't. And this has been tested in many other contexts as well. So they're getting at what's called identity framing here in their language. And that's a really smart thing to do. Um, as the research shows, this is from the Millennial Impact Project, which is a very large body of research uh, funded by the Case Foundation, um, which is now Case Impact. Um, and the Case Foundation had studied millennials as movers of social change and it said this, millennials wanna take positive actions every day or week. And they see that as part of their identity. That was a different take from, I show up at a demonstration once a month or something like that. It's, I do it every day, it's part of who I am. So this idea of being a truth teller and showing up every day was really tapping into the identity of millennials, very smart messaging. So think about again, of all the things you can say for your cause, do you really have a handful of winning words that you really want to use to frame it? Let's move on to um, strategic stories because I see we have 10 minutes. Um, that translates to, and Carrie and um, Eric, uh, Evan have both mentioned this, that messaging is awesome, but it's really when you get into storytelling is where you're hitting um, on all centers. And this is all cylinders. And this is what science says, that storytelling is the most powerful way to open people's eyes to things to motivate them. And here's what we mean by strategic storytelling. Creating stories of specific people in specific settings and situations that convey those big ideas that are shown to motivate your target audience. So not just telling any story. A lot of people are into storytelling because they've heard how important it is. And of course it touches the heart. But if you wanna have a measurable effect out of it, there's a couple things you need to do. One of those is to frame it first. What the studies of storytelling and persuasion and motivation show is that you need to hear that big idea before you hear the story. If you really want, uh, if you're really gonna see people remember the, the lesson, if you will, and, and say that they remember it and change their attitude about something, you have to frame it first. So that's what those winning words, that's what the message is doing for us in this particular example. And this is uh, our campaign in Massachusetts where I lived and worked at the time. <clears throat> and we uh, worked on the battle there, which was four or five years long to save it in the first state that had marriage equality. And this was an example of our storytelling campaign. This was two women who stuck together after one was diagnosed with cancer. So we have this frame and then we're telling literally hundreds and thousands of real authentic stories that all communicate the same big idea that strategic storytelling. You also need to be strategic in your use of imagery. And what we found through this, and I know Evan can speak to it as well, that that really helped unleash a lot of power of the grassroots power of the movement. And the same frame and the storytelling came through in grassroots organizing, lobbying legislative elected officials, in the urine media, of course, and through advertising. And I know my experience in Massachusetts when we were 
trying to mobilize people, um, same-sex couples whose lives were being affected, when we were framing it around the legal stuff and the constitution and all of that, it was people didn't feel as comfortable or competent, if you will, talking about that. But when we simply said, tell your story, they were able to do that. So it really helped unleash it. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Evan, the power of this? Uh, I think, no, well, I guess the one other uh, point I'll make, but I know, I know we're short on time, is we also tried not to isolate gay people alone. Uh, we tried to show gay people with non-gay people. We often would use non-gay people as messengers. We talked about non-gay validators, family members, uh, and uh, co-workers, and so on, not because we were trying to hide gay people, but because we were trying to communicate to the audience that gay people weren't isolated, atomistic others. We were parts of the family, parts of the community, and indeed, marriage is a family matter. It's not only about the couple. It, it's about connection and inclusion, and being able to show that helped people relate to the message, but also sometimes they would relate to the messenger better, which would then bring them in. Great. Let's look at um, a famous example of storytelling from the Truth Campaign. Um, I think my video should work. Body bags ad, <laughs> very powerful. Carrie, in a couple sentences, what what's strategic there? What's happening behind that? Well, the idea is, you know, that a lot a lot gets hidden behind the statistics. And when you you know you put out the the morbidity mortality statements, and you talk about deaths from tobacco, it's really hard to ignore a pile of body bags. And again. We did that with a lot of different things, but that's the idea is turning those sort of dry statistics. The truth campaign was based on facts and statistics, but the elegance was in the, the ways we brought it to life. You can't really escape that. Um, and we did it with all kinds of things. We had ads that looked like the trailer for a horror movie um, that was revealed to be called Tobacco at the end. And they were such great ads. They ran in movie theaters before movies that predominantly uh, attracted a teen audience. And the movie theaters would have kids come out later and say, when's that tobacco movie launching? You know, like, so we, we really kind of broke through by using a lot of pop culture technique, a lot of sort of um, shock and awe kind of production value to make this clear this wasn't like your typical public health campaign. And all of it told a story of teenagers rising up as truth tellers like that. Exactly. So great segue once again, facts. Last step in this process, and this is a really important one, help people think it through and be their best selves. I'm going to get a little wonky here. We're talking about thinking it through, elaborate, elaboration careful consideration of information ideas by the recipients of a persuasive message. Here's why that's important. Attitude change based on high levels of elaboration is more likely to influence thought and behavior and more likely to be persistent over time and resistant to counterattack. To get to that durable attitude change, everything we've set up to now is going to help you get there because some of the drivers of this are I see my own um, my see my own values and aspirations reflected. That's one thing that motivates people. I'm able to process it. I'm able to think about it. Keeping it simple, using stories that makes it easier for me to do. And then we're going to talk about that here. Actively helping people think it through. That's where you're going to seal the deal. Let's look at an example of that on the marriage. Um, marriage uh, campaign. And this is an ad I'm going to show quickly and then I'll, I'll ask you what's going on here, Evan. 
where I grew up, gay people were not in the forefront and in the community. Over the years, I've met some gay and lesbian couples, and their commitment to each other is just like our commitment to each other. Build around love, just like any other relationship. As a parent, as a neighbor, the golden rule is very important. We teach our children to treat people the way we want to be treated. I would absolutely not want anyone to tell me that I could not get married. And we certainly wouldn't want to deny that for anyone else. Winning words. Evan, what did you call those ads? What was, tell us quickly what was going on there. Yeah, actually this very short ad bundles a lot of the precepts that we were trying to follow. So on the one hand, there was a journey story, what we call a journey story, someone had changed their mind. I used to think this, we, growing up I learned, I heard that, but I changed. We give people permission to change their mind. They're talking about admiring gay couples, people they've seen, not feeling sorry for them, not pitying them, but admiring the dignity, the courage, the love they've shown in their life. And they're manifesting the empathy of caring about some of somebody else that they're describing. They talk about the golden rule. So it's a very conscious attempt to invoke values that resonate in sort of religious terms, but isn't a religious argument. It's going to the heart beneath the sort of the maybe the knee jerk religious shutdown that some people might have wanted to use. And and I think the other thing that's really important to see in this ad is that it's it's obviously non gay people or presumably non gay people, parents talking in front of their kids. And they they are talking about as parents, we want to teach our kids values and so we want them to live up to the values of love and empathy and da da da. So they're saying that, but they're also showing it because they're showing they're not afraid to talk about this in front of their kids. The kids are there. Yep. And this is back to some of the psychology. What we heard the man say, I want to be a good parent, a good neighbor, a good coworker. Remember we talked about identity, aspirational identity. That's exactly what he's talking about. So sharing examples and stories of people in your target audience, changing their minds is a very powerful strategy. And Evan, this is something else Evan said to me as I was interviewing him for this article, which I showed you, which I happen to have right here on my desk in Stanford Social Innovation Review. We transformed the question from how do you feel about gay, so what kind of person are you? That was a very interesting shift in perspective. And this is really what is going on. It's a powerful thing that's going on in the minds of people who are, who are wrestling with an issue. What kind of person am I? How do I show up here? Um, I'm going to bang through uh, the truth section here. Carrie already mentioned how facts, it's interesting, kind of surprising, facts were a big part of it. So they were doing that a lot, just giving teenagers facts about the matter. But here's an interesting thing we found in researching what they're up to now. The Truth Initiative partnered with the Mayo Clinic to create this um, place called Become an Ex, an ex-smoker, that helps people think it through. And if you look down at the lower left of your screen, the first step is to design a customized quit plan, think it through. And the first thing it tells you to do, or it says your vision of who you want to be will focus your plan on what really matters. Right there, the public health experts saying, tap into people's aspirational identity to motivate them to do something really hard like quit smoking. So I'll end on that note, prompt you to think what ideas, information, activities, stories can you provide that help people think through your issue. There's a lot of other ways to do what we've just uh, shown you here. I'm checking my clock and it looks like we're at the end. Thank you, Carrie and Evan, for bringing in questions from the audience along the way. Um, I'm going to end it here telling people you can go to these resources um, if you'd like to um, get more information. Uh, there's a podcast called Achieve Great Things. That's my podcast. There's an interview with Evan and I talking about this, SSIR, of course. Uh, this on the right is an article by Evan uh, reflecting on this and how these uh, lessons from the movement can be used by other movements for social justice and racial, uh, racial equity. Uh, so we encourage you to look at that. Um, feel free to email us at hadawayinfo at hadaway.com if you'd like more information on this topic or what we do. Um, I'm told that we have a little time if we, um, if folks want to stay and ask some, ask some questions. Um, Carrie, you want to look at some questions, see if we have some we can answer in a couple minutes? 
Yeah, we got some themes about sort of cost and timing, you know, how, what kind of money did this require and how long did it take? Um, and, you know, Truth, came, Truth started in 1998, so it's been going on for, for a while. Um, and, and sometimes it had lots of money and sometimes it didn't. And I think the, the question of money to me is not as, as important as the question of, of I, was, I always call it courage, the ability to carve a new path and create a campaign that people are paying attention to, you know, that's, that's worth its weight in gold, that sort of idea of how do you, how do you get people talking with the sophistication and cleverness of your communication. So, you know, we'd all love more money, um, but I think the answer is, is when you do these other things, you get to the messages that make people sit up and take notice and you make better use of the money that you do have. But I know you all on the, on the marriage equality side also have experienced that. Yep, how you use the resources, that's always the trickiest thing. That's an interesting example here, like getting, being super strategic and sharp about the focus of, for your audience, and not trying to do everything at once. There are a few questions I've been able to open the Q&A now. Um, there are a few questions about, about that. Um, I know my take is a few elements here. You need an authentic a message that's authentic, authentic to you, authentic to the people who care about your cause. And you want to start there and find ways to meet others in the middle, like we demonstrated here with the marriage equality, um, because you obviously need to do that too. I remember, as I mentioned, when we had on, we actually did research with people involved in the campaign who had stopped participating and weren't responding to calls to action. And we did focus groups with them. And a lot of people said they were sort of, you know, down about it. Um, they needed to be re-energized. Really have to keep an eye on your base, so to speak, and don't take people for granted. But then looking at that realm of uh, decision makers, influencers, people don't agree with you, don't, don't think that just because they, they seem like they don't agree with you, don't think you don't have an opportunity there. And really try to understand it. We call it segment the audience according to those different angles you can take. And that takes time. It obviously takes money to do its scale. And none of this happens fast. Um, but to answer a number of questions, yes, you want to think um, in pretty nuanced ways like that. I think there are ways to brand a cause at a very high level that speaks to a lot of people, like love and commitment, I think, does. Um, and then other people have very specific sort of themes or interests you can, uh, you can work with. What's another question, Evan or Carrie? Doug, could you go back to the six steps? Some people are just wanting to have the steps back up on the screen. Yeah, let me see if I can, whoops. This um, platform won't let me do as much as I want. Can you see those? Yeah. Those are in, you can also email me at info at hadaway.com and we'll shoot this to you. We can send it to you. Um, those are your six steps. I think there, there are some questions about, um, you know, how do you, de how you deal with really highly charged issues or when your words have been co-opted by the other side of the, uh, the other side of the argument? Yep. Yeah, the battle over big words. It's really, it's a very good question because, and this comes up in lots of different contexts um, where one side uses a word and then the other side tries to co-opt it or doesn't want to use it because the other side's using it. An example that we've looked at in research is the idea of responsibility. Because for so long, the idea of individual responsibility has been used as a hammer to say you're on your own, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We don't do social programs and policies in this country, right? It's all about individual responsibility. When we did a work called American Aspirations, exploring aspirations and values held by people from all walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds across the country, number one aspiration that came up for people was to be responsible. So it was a very important idea. And we didn't just want the anti-social justice people to be used to own the word responsibility. So we defined it in our own way. So that's my take on that. If there's a word that's powerful and operative in a debate, you need to understand how it's working, who it's working with, and how you can reframe it for your purposes. We were able to reframe responsible around, for example, the responsibilities of business to provide uh, jobs that pay well and uh, 
focus on the impact of their business on their community and their customers, not just their bottom line. And it makes the word responsible business owner mean a whole new thing. So that's just an example of how you can use words like that. So I'd be careful about not using a word just because the other side is using it. Really figure out how it works for you and your purposes. Um, somebody asked this question, which we get a lot as well, about not being perceived as manipulative when telling stories. This says about gun violence or highly charged issues, right? Absolutely. When you're telling stories of real people in real situations, we want to do that ethically. And there's a good conversation and good guidelines, and a lot of folks in ComNet have been talking about this, ethical strategic storytelling. I know in my experience, over decades of this, starting with helping people tell, often victims of crime or discrimination, tell their stories to uh, members of Congress and to congressional committees, they wanted to tell their story. So that's the first thing. You're doing with people who want to tell their story. A lot of people find that is empowering to them, um, therapeutic for them in some cases. It can be a very powerful thing to help somebody tell their story. And then part of the job is help them shape their story in a way that's effective, that's strategic for the purpose. So there's an issue of expression and people authentically expressing themselves meets being strategic and persuasive. Um, so for example, prepping people for a congressional hearing, we'd get like three minutes to tell a very sad, convoluted, you know, sad story. And it took a lot of time to help people do that. Um, of course, sharing stories of people through media is different, but you can definitely do it ethically and responsibly in a way that people feel empowered and that they're using their story for, for a good purpose and for their own purpose. We still have people on asking questions. I'm happy to keep going. <laughs> we still have 65 people. Yep, let's keep going with questions. Yeah, I think there's a question about social media, which is, it's really interesting to me that um, the Truth Campaign didn't use social media at all. It didn't exist um, when it started. They certainly do a lot, lot more now. Um, I think the question, it's not easier or harder, it's just um, more complicated. You know, you have to really understand each channel and what it's good for um, and who you're reaching through it. You know, not everybody is on every channel and you can use them really thoughtfully for different purposes. Uh, Jay Janeski asked a question, says the framework is incredible, use it in my own work. Do you think any of these six need to be revisited, removed, or removed in a 2020 context? That's interesting. My answer would be no. Um, what I looked at here, and it's interesting because when we're talking about, you know, aspirations that people have, yeah, those are going to shift with what's going on in the world around them. Absolutely. But the question still remains because the power of aspiration, aspirational identity, aspirational communication is that's sort of one of the truths of what motivates us as people. So looking at sort of longitudinal studies in psychology and linguistics and other areas that sort of what makes people tick, um, that's where we go to to find out, you know, what are really important questions we need to ask, sort of timeless questions versus what do you think about the topic that you're reading about right now? Um, so these elements of it, we're always going to need stories, we're always going to need winning words, right? We're always going to need, I think, elaboration and getting people to think things through to achieve that durability effect. So I think this framework's you know, useful right now. And there are other useful frameworks too, of course. I think we're, we're getting waved, we're getting played off the stage. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for sticking with me as I figured out the technology at the beginning of this. Thank you, Carrie and Evan, for your wisdom and your generosity. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining in. Have a great comment. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.